So, so far we've talked about electric fields and electric potentials of just a single point. Whether it's a positive point or a, ne or a negative point, it's only just been of a single point. But what happens if we were to take a whole bunch of those points and lay them in a flat line? Well, we would get something that looks sort of like a bar. Something that looks like this. Now on the far right, I just denote what the charge of this entire bar is. And all of these are positive charge. And all of these are the exact same charge. Now we want to look at what the electric field would, lo would look like around this bar. So this is how I'm going to represent it. All of these are going to be pointing in the downwards direction. It's going to create a uniform field facing away from my bar. But wait, Mr. G, I thought when we drew our points before that they were the electric field lines were radiating out away from in every direction. Something that looks like this. And so, if these are all pointing out in every direction, left, right, up, down, why is it that you're saying now that these are only pointing downwards? And yes, that's true, that at a single point, they radiate out in all directions with positive charge. But if you also remember, when we went back and talked about electric fields, and we had two points, and we wanted to see what the electric potential was somewhere in the middle of them. Well, what we found out was that that direction of the electric field was only in the downwards direction. And why was that? Well, I guess what you said was that the electric field at this point based off of, can I just call this A and this one B? And you said A pointed out to the side, away. And B also pointed out away and to the side. But then you also said that the horizontal components from A and the horizontal component of B canceled out. Exactly. So since the left component of B and the right component of A cancel each other out, this exact same property is happening right up here in my parallel bar. If we think about the farthest object, we'll call this one A, and the opposite one, we'll call that one B, well the net electric field, no matter where they are on the far sides, they're always going to cancel out. And the same thing with the ones next to them and next to them and next to them, all the way until the middle. The total charge that's happening, the total electric field in this area has to only point in the downwards direction because of the canceling of my two like charges. So now what we're doing is we're putting a positive plate up top and I also now inserted a negative plate on the bottom. So in this area the entire electric field is only pointing in the downwards direction. Now what were to happen if I were to put a little positive particle inside of this electric field? Just held it there and let it go. So it's stationary initially. What would happen to it? Make a prediction. Now hopefully what you think would happen would be that as this charge, as this charged particle is released, it now has the freedom to move. And inside of this electric field, well, it's going to want to move away from that positive top plate, and it's going to want to move towards the, po the negative bottom plate. So this is going to feel a force. It's going to change its velocity, so there's going to be a force that's applied. And using Newton's second law, what we can say is that force that's being applied is also equal to mass times its acceleration.
Well, what does that have to do with anything? Because so far, we haven't had an object move. We haven't really looked at the mass of anything. Why is all this coming back into the situation now? Can you answer me that? What, you think I just brought something up that means nothing? There, I'm just willy-nilly bringing back Newton's second law? Think about this. What did we use during the electric fields that required the formula, that had a formula that required force? Well, if I'm not mistaken, I believe we ended up going from a force formula that had force equals k q1 lowercase q over r squared and we turn that into dividing by our charge to be force over q is equal to the electric field. So now that you have force over charge is equal to my electric field where do you think I want to go now that we have all of this information out here? Well, so if I got force by itself, by multiplying by the charge, I should have the electric field multiplied by the charge would give me F. And if I have F by itself, and I have F by itself, I could probably do some substitution. So now I have F all by itself, and I have F all by itself. Could I put these two formulas together and say that the electric field multiplied by my charge is equal to mass times acceleration? But where do I go from here? Because again, we haven't used mass or acceleration yet, Mr. G. Exactly. We haven't used mass, mass yet. But this is exactly where I want to see you at. Because what we can do is we can isolate acceleration. We can find out how fast that object would go from the top plate to the bottom plate as I let it go. So I can find acceleration to get it all by itself. Just by dividing by the mass. So what I'd be left with is I'd be left with acceleration on the right hand side and the electric field multiplied by the charge that some particle has and divided by the mass of that particle would be equivalent to the acceleration. Go on Mr. G, I'm lost. We're solving for these variables but they don't mean anything to me. I don't get what this is supposed to mean. How is this helpful to anything that I need to do? Well, you remember when we related gravitational potential energy, gravitational fields to electric potential and electric fields? Acceleration is going to do that exact same thing. You're not saying we're getting back into kinematics, are you? Because if I'm seeing this right, I now have acceleration by itself, and I should be able to put it into formulas to find out how fast it's moving when it's hitting the ground, as well as how long it would take for it to fall using, um, how about this one? The first one, yes. We can now substitute the electric field and the charge of the particle and the mass of the particle and find out how fast my object is moving at the very end or how fast it was moving initially or how far it fell. We can do that. We can rearrange this any way we wanted to. Yes. where we have now substituted in EQ over M into every place where we see an A. And we can do that same thing here, and we could solve for time. We could also solve for 
how far the object falls. But again, substituting in EQ over M into our acceleration spot. We'll get this. How is that looking now? Okay, here's a problem that I want you to solve. I want for you to tell me what the charge to mass ratio of my situation that I'm about to tell you about is. I don't know what the mass of my particle is, and I don't know what the charge of it is, and I don't really care what they are. What I want for you to tell me, though, is what is the relationship between the charge and the mass. Now, here are the parameters. My positively charged particle is in between two plates. I've got a negative plate and I've got a positive plate, and they're separated by 0 0.5 meters. The electric field between these two plates is 200 newtons per coulomb. Now, could you answer that for me? Okay, so, so you're looking for how, for what the charge to mass ratio is, or Q over M. Well, the last time we used mass, it was in the acceleration formula, which we switched around to say EQ over M was our acceleration, was equal to A. And we were able to put these into our kinematic formulas. So I guess the two that we used already, we had we had velocity final squared is equal to velocity initial squared plus two my quantity of A times the displacement. I also had displacement is equal to one half a t squared. So if I try and think, initially it's going to be let go from rest. So, well, this is going to be zero. That's a known quantity. I know the electric field. That's a known quantity. And I'm looking for my ratio between the q and the n. And I know my separation distance. I've got 0.5. But Velocity final wasn't given to me in this situation, so I guess I probably won't use that top one. But the bottom one, I've got a separation distance of y. One half is a constant, and then we have e, again, a known, looking for a quantity of q over m, and t squared. Well, we were never given a time either. So neither of these work. What should we do? I'm going to let you think about the parameters. And then, after a little bit of thought, you'll come to it. But I gave you enough information. Okay, so you gave me enough information, but we didn't need these two equations. And I don't remember any other time that we had a mass and a charge related besides this one formula. Let's look back at what you told us. And so we have 0.5 meters separation as the separation distance. The E field is 200 newtons per coulomb. What else was there? Oh! I got the positive plate on the bottom and a negative plate on top. And my particle is also charged positively. So, since my plate is charged negatively up top and my object is positive, well, it's going to be repelled from the positive plate on the bottom, and it's also going to be attracted to the negative plate, so it's, going to only go, it's only going to go up. But it's already at the top, so we all know. We're lost. Bingo. That's what I was waiting for you to see. So now I'll give you the last bit of information. 
after I let, we're going to switch around the charges of our plates. So we're going to have the negative on bottom, we're going to have the positive on top. And now the last bit of information I'm going to tell you is it took exactly 4.00 seconds for this particle to reach from the top to the bottom plate. So, the time is 4.0 seconds. Now can you tell me what to do? So now we can go into our kinematic formulas and since you gave us a time, we're going to use the one that has the time involved in it. So we'll have that separation distance, one half, and the electric field which was given, and the time. Now we're going to isolate for our Q over M. So I want to keep Q over M since they're already on top. Q is on top of M. I'll just rearrange everything to move over to the left hand side. And then from here I can just put the numbers in and I can have 2 multiplied by 1 half of a meter gives me 1. And then I have 200, on uh, 200 for my E. And I know the time, which is 4 seconds squared, which gives me 600, or 16. Now it should be pretty simple. So I should have 1 divided by 2 times 16 gives me 32 with two zeros. So my final answer should look something like this, where I now have 1 meter over 3200 newtons times seconds squared all over coulombs. And that simplifies down to B. So our final answer ends up becoming 3.125 times 10 to the negative fourth coulombs per kilogram. So for every kilogram that I have, I need 3.125 times 10 to the negative fourth coulombs of charge. Fantastic. Nice job. Okay, so, so we solved that problem. It's, it's, it's a little challenging, but what does this do for me? What, why are we solving these problems? Yeah, I can figure out how fast, how far, how long it takes for it to hit the ground or hit the other plate, but where is the application? What role does this play? I've never seen it before. Well, I can give you two. So the first one isn't applicable really anymore, um, but it was. The very first televisions had a screen placed over here. What they did was these two plates changed how much charge, how, how much charge there was on each plate. And they would shoot electrons through here very, very fast. So you have this electron, it's traveling, and it would get pulled down a little bit or a lot based off of what the charge on here was. And so these electrons would travel, and they would get bent down, and then eventually they would hit the screen. And when they hit the screen, once they hit the screen, they created a bright spot. And same thing, once the charge on the bottom side decreased a little bit, and they shot another one through, it wouldn't bend as much. There wouldn't be as much of an acceleration in the downwards direction. So the next one might come through and bend just a little bit. And each one of those bright spots, as they happened very quickly, created an image. So the first TVs used this same information. Now the second one, though, is something that you see every day. Well, at least you see the results of it. So what I have drawn here is two different diagrams. Diagram one is on the right, diagram two is on the left. And in diagram one, what this is showing is it's showing a side view of a laser jet printer. Some of you might have this at home, as well as the printers at school have laser jets. And what happens in a laser jet printer is we have a laser that protrude that shoots a beam onto this top roller. Wherever that beam hits creates a slightly positive charge. Wherever it doesn't hit is neutral. So as this 
roller rotates around and it goes into what's called the hopper. It touches the surface of the hopper. It picks up some of the toner, which is negatively charged. So then as it rolls back around, it now has the image of whether it's a letter or whether it's a picture, as it rolls around and it gets picked up by the paper as it's pressed by the top roller. So the side view image of it, you might see something that looks like this. And again, it would see only a line at a time as it rolls through, but you would see something that looks like that. And then as it rolls into the toner, it picks up the, the toner only where it has the slightly positive A, B, C, and D. And then it comes back up, and all the toner that's on our roller now goes straight onto the piece of paper that gets fed through this roller, and it shoots right back out. So this is where you see the results of what we were just talking about every day.